So thank you. This year's laureate, Jim Allison, was born in the small South Texas town of Alice in 1948. From an early age, he was drawn to science. He played with his chemistry set and was fascinated by dissecting frogs. His father was a doctor in the town. Jim Allison sometimes accompanied him on house calls. But when doing that, he realized that following in his father's footsteps wasn't exactly what he wanted. During high school, he ran into a teacher who would not teach evolution. Allison took this very, very seriously. To him, biology without Darwin was like physics without Newton. He therefore refused to take the class, and this put him in danger of actually failing high school. Fortunately, a compromise was reached. He fulfilled the requirements by taking college biology by correspondence with the University of Texas, where he later also received a bachelor's and PhD in biochemistry. As an immunologist, Dr. James Allison's fundamental discoveries in parallel with others include defining the structure of the T-cell antigen receptor, demonstrating that CD28 provides co-stimulatory signals necessary for full T-cell activation, and showing that CTLA-4 is an inhibitory checkpoint which impedes activation of T-cells. All of this was basic research, and based on this basic research, Allison was the first to propose and demonstrate that immune checkpoint blockade might be a powerful strategy to treat tumors. As we will hear more about, he was also involved in the development of ipilimumab, a monoclonal antibody which was approved by FDA for treatment of metastatic melanoma seven years ago. Dr. Allison is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Medicine. He has received numerous awards, including the Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Association of Immunologists, the Lloyd J. Old Award, the Novartis Award in Clinical Immunology, the Medal of Honor in Basic Research from the American Cancer Society, the Harvey Prize in Human Health, the Breakthrough Prize in Biosciences, the Wolf Prize, and in 2015, the Lasky DeBakey Clinical Medical Research Award. Now, if he hadn't been and become a scientist, Jim Allison may well have become a musician. He has played the harmonica, at least casually, since his youth. He told me that he became more serious in playing the, the harmonica during his postdoctoral years in California. And this culminated with playing on stage with Willie Nelson at the Stingery Bar by the Sea in downtown San Diego. Now, that wouldn't be Allison's last run in with Willie Nelson and, and his band. It so happened that Nelson's longtime harmonica player, Mickey Raphael, read about Allison's research in, in the newspaper. And he then invited him to uh, come and play with the band. So in 2016, in what he calls one of the five best moments in his life, Allison and Raphael traded harmonica solos on stage with Willie Nelson, and they remain friends to this day. Please welcome this year's laureate, Jim Allison. Thank you, Dr. Smith and Mr. President and members of the Selection Committee and members of the Nobel Assembly. I'm really honored to have the opportunity to speak to you, all noted guests here and give you some insights into what we've been doing and why we've been doing it for the last several years. I'd like to dedicate this, this talk to the many uh, students and fellows that have trained with me and really done the work that I'm going to be talking about over the years and also to the doctors and the patients that were involved at, at, at no small risk to themselves in the early clinical trials, and finally uh, to my partner in life, 
uh, in science, Dr. Padmini Sharma, with whom much of the work I was doing, is, I'm going to show you, is done in collaboration. Now, where's the... Oh. And so the people, I've tried to list some of these people, of course they aren't all up there, but the people whose names are in red are people who contributed specifically to the new work I'm going to show you uh, later today. And what I want to try to do is show you the early stuff that we did uh, leading up to the idea of, of checkpoint blockade, show you where that's at, and then uh, finish with some mechanistic studies that have provided some surprising new insight into how this uh, actually uh, occurs. So why would you want to use immunotherapy to treat cancer? Well, I think we all know now uh, that, that cancer is a disease of many uh, diverse gene mutations. Uh, ultimately, the, t the tumor cells become highly um, in, in unstable with respect to genomic integrity. And so it really can be viewed as many different cancers, each of, uh, independent of histotype, each which are caused by distinct genetic mechanisms. But one of the things we've learned since the war on cancer started is that trying to target these single causative mutations with, with targeted small molecules always essentially leads to relapse um, after response. And that's because there's so many mutations by the time you target one, there's already a resistant mechanism which the tumor can use to, after selection to, to bypass it. But T cells, which has been my love ever since I heard about them in, in graduate school, um, offer three things that really other kinds of cancer treatment do not. And the first one is specificity. I think that everybody knows that T cell recognize peptides on the surface of the cells presented by MHC molecules that tell the immune system what's going on in them. And we know now from work of Bob Schreiber and, and many others that in the case of T cells, they're focused on the mutations, products of the mutations uh, that occur in the tumor cell, not just the ones that cause it, which is what targeted therapies do, but pretty much any of them. So you can get polyvalency you know, by targeting these because the immune system doesn't know what the mutations are. It doesn't know whether they're causative or not. It doesn't matter. They just tell the immune system something's different. The second thing is once you've got T cells, a number of them become slowly renewing memory cells. And so they're there for the rest of your life, basically, and can be reawakened if necessary to come after the tumor again. And finally, the immune system is, is very adaptable. You've probably got 50 to 70 million different T cells circulating around, uh, which and that, cost, that can change with time since the uh, immune system is generating new ones. So the immune system can adapt uh, spontaneously to changes in the tumor. And so it's easily a match to cancer, which is the, the whole theme of this talk. Uh, so I'm just going to condense a lot of work here <clears throat> to get everybody on the same page. Um, in, in 1982, we worked out the structure of the antigen receptor, uh, heterodimer. Um, but with antibodies, a number of labs showed after that, that soon after that, that um, signaling through the T cell receptor by itself was not sufficient to activate T cells. You needed additional co-stimulatory signals that were provided only by very specialized cells, such as dendritic cells. In 1988, we showed that that receptor for those signals was a molecule called CD28. And others show that the ligands for it are B7. But we, there was an also, also a molecule called CTLA-4, which had an unknown function. It was only known that it, it did not, was not expressed until after T cell activation. So the current view is when the T cell gets a T cell receptor signal and a CD28 co stimulatory signal, you turn on two pathways, two, two programs. Shown in green, there are a lot of genes that are associated, whose products are associated with cell proliferation because you have to expand a few dozen cells of any particular type to hundreds of thousands of cells very quickly to get the soldiers in the field to attack the cancer. Uh, but you also start, this wasn't really realized until about 1994, uh, you also start an off program by induction of the program in, induced by uh, CTLA-4 expression, which eventually accumulates in a cell uh, and can turn T cells off. Um, so without going through all the work, one of the things that we had shown in the meantime is that tumor cells, many mouse tumor cells have plenty of antigens uh, and we showed that because if you put B7 molecules into them so that they can provide co-stimulation, they'll Im immediately get rejected. But normally they're not rejected because they're invisible to the immune system, not because they lack antigens, because they can't give the second signal. 
And so I reasoned at the time that, and, and you can't start an immune response until tumor cells die, and these specialized tu uh, dendritic cells come in, pick up the bits of dying tumors, redisplay the antigens on their surface in the context of B7. So this cross priming then initiates an immune response against T against tumor cells, and. Um, but then CTLA-4, of course, is the normal process is induced, and so it's a kind of race. You know, the tumors had a head start, and if the tumor gets to such a mass as the T cells can't generate enough to take care of it, we thought, then the tumor wins um, because this, they would be turned off by CTLA-4. So we had the idea of just disabling the brakes by putting in an antibody to CTLA-4, a very simple process, and just keeping the brakes on and letting the T cells keep running. Well, we uh, did this, uh, well, anyway, what, that's shown on this cartoon on the right, uh, and there's, there's a couple of features there that are, that are very interesting when I first thought of this. One is that we're, not, we're targeting the immune system, not the tumor cells, so the kind of cancer doesn't make any difference. It shouldn't make any difference because, you know, all tumors have neoantigens, <clears throat> and uh, um, it really doesn't matter what kind of cancer. So we don't have to make a new drug for every cancer cell. It's a universal therapy that could be potentially used for any kind of cancer. And the second one is, since it started by cross-priming, you can take advantage of uh, that priming by death to use it in combination with chemotherapy, radiation, hormone therapy, whatever kills some tumor cells, and give agents that do those things properties of the immune uh, therapy as well. And so, um, there we go, sorry. And uh, so the idea, of course, is a wonderful idea, but does it work? And so this just shows one of the first experiments we did. We've got um, uh, transplantable tumors growing in the backs of mice. As you can see, untreated, they grow. We have to euthanize the mice. Block CD28, they grow faster. But if we inject antibodies to CTLA-4, the tumor grows for a while and then gets rejected. And so when we got this result, um, I, was, I was amazed. I expected it to slow the tumor, but it just completely eliminated them. Covering up this one molecule out of everything that's going on was sufficient to give tumor rejection. So, so just to make a long story very short, uh, after two years' delay, because people in part couldn't understand how you could treat cancer by ignoring the cancer cell and treating the immune system, uh, we uh, worked with a company called Metarex and made a anti-human CTLA-4 antibody called ipilimumab. And this is a patient in a phase one trial. It uh, started about 2000. This is May 2001, um, actually, when she started. Uh, you can see these big tumors uh, in her lungs. She had metastatic melanoma that had failed every therapy, including high-dose IL-2 and a dendritic cell vaccine. She got one injection of uh, three mg per kg of CTLA-4. And I happened to visit Tony Rebus, her doctor, uh, in 2011, 10 years after she'd gotten that injection. The CAT scan on the right is from her 10th year checkup after, again, that single injection. And she's actually still doing fine. She's almost 19 years out now from metastatic melanoma. And I should point out that when we started this work, the median life expectancy after diagnosis with, with metastatic melanoma was 11 months. So it was essentially a death sentence, and there was no drug that had ever prolonged life uh, to any level whatsoever. So there are a lot of trials done, resulting in a phase three registration trial uh, with uh, overall survival as the endpoint, which took almost four and a half years to complete. And what you can see here is this is the ipilimumab line, this one. This is the placebo control here. Uh, and what you can see is we moved the survival over about four months, which would have been sufficient for FDA approval because no drug had ever done that before. But as you can see here, a very interesting thing happens between two and three years. If the survival curve flattens out and stayed that way for the duration of the trial, which means basically nobody is dying of the disease after about three years. And so by 2015, there was follow-up data on several thousand patients. What you can see here is it's the same. At three years, it kind of flattens out, stays that way for 10 years and about 20, a little over 20% of the patients. So I think for all intents and purposes for this disease, people that make it past four years, I really think you can consider them to be cured. 
and they don't have to worry about, you know, what's going to go on. I wouldn't say that lightly. It's based, again, on several thousand patients uh, with this, this follow-up therapy. But the question is, why isn't it 100%? You know, why is it just a fraction? There's a number of mechanistic reasons why that might be true. Um, but, of course, there's another possibility that there were other checkpoints. And, and Dr. Hanjo had discovered a molecule called PD-1, and by, by about 2001, it was shown that it was another checkpoint, actually, um, and it differs in, in, in a couple of important ways. One of them is that one of its ligands can actually be expressed on the surface of tumor cells and induced by gamma interferon made by the CD8 cell. What that means is then that rather than working at priming like c 4 it's working on fully differentiated cells at the end of their development. Um, and turning off the functional cells um, by interaction of pd one on the tumor cell with PD-1 on the T cell. And I'll come back to that in detail in a while. Um, anyway, there was very quickly, this went to clinical trials. This is a summary of a phase one trial done by Suzanne Tapali and very good results in melanoma, non-small cell lung cancer, renal cancer, no responses in colorectal cancer, although later on, Bert Vogelstein shows there's a subset that has genomic instability, that has microsatellite instability, defects in DNA damage repair. This subset has a large number of mutations and patients with that defect do respond. Uh, and then there's also no responses to castrate-resistant prostate cancer. And I'll show you later that we, I think, figured out why that is in a, in a way around it. Uh, so where do we go? Well, obviously, combinations. You've got two different drugs that work at different stages of, of T-cell development. And so put them together. And so this is a trial, uh, one of several really put together by, by uh, Jed Walchuk and, and others. This is the ipilimumab-only arm. And you can see here the, the anti-PD-1 anti and the volumab antibody here, plus anti-CTLA-4, there's a 60% response rate now when you combine those two functionally different checkpoints. And uh, the last time I checked, the survival is out to about four years on these patients. So we're getting close to the point of knowing whether this is going to be as durable as ipilimumab alone, and there's no reason to think that it won't be. And so I think we've gone here for this remarkably from a, a, a almost uniformly fatal disease to being able to get meaningful responses that last per, perhaps for decades as well uh, with this combination in, in 60% of melanomas. And so that's the best response thing. I and mean, a lot of people say, well, this is just a melanoma drug. Uh, that's not really true. There are various trials have been done. The FDA has approved these, uh, these agents for non-small cell lung cancer, uh, for renal cell cancer, Hodgkin's lymphoma, bladder cancer, head and neck, Merkel cell, which is a very, even more lethal form of skin cancer. Also, uh, gastric cancer and a palate cellular carcinoma. And I'll come back to this. This is really a remarkable approval. So any tumor of any histotype that has defects in DNA damage repair and consequently has high low levels of uh, neoantigens can be treated regardless of what kind of cancer they are. Uh, for that. The first time there's ever been approval for a particular genetic defect uh, in, a, in a class of tumors. Um, and so we're in a pretty good setting. We know a lot of tumors uh, respond, not all, and not all of them as high a fraction as we would like. Uh, so to go forward really in a rational way, we need to know the cellular mechanism. Uh, cellular molecular mechanisms of the effects uh, so that we can, you know, design the best way to combine things and develop strategies for identifying patients who are going to uh, respond. Uh, and so at MD Anderson, uh, Dr. Shorman and I uh, built on some work that she'd been doing for some time um, in, in genital urinary cancers to develop what we call the, the um, immunotherapy platform, and the goal of this is to do mechanistic studies on any patient with any kind of cancer uh, that's being treated with any drug that uh, would have impact on the immune system. Of course, we define that as anything, basically. Uh, and the idea is to get tissue and blood from them and analyze it by all the techniques that we can to get some insight into what's going on. And I'm not going to go through the details, but so far we've, we've got enrolled over 3,000 patients have gotten matched samples of, of uh, tissue and blood from those patients. And so um, I'll just show you one brief thing about 
uh, what, how we've used this to study what's going on in prostate cancer. So as I told you, there were no responses in a phase one with, with PD-1. With, with early trials of ipilimumab, there were responders, a small number, but remarkable responses of, of men whose PSA went to undetectable and had um, um, metastases disappear and, and symptomatic relief and everything. So this went to a phase three trial shown here, which unfortunately failed. There was no real significant difference between the ipilimumab only you know, treatment and uh, the placebo control. And so we wanted to find out what that was. So uh, using um, uh, Dr. Sharma's approach to this, which is to do with localized uh, treatment with localized cancers, what's called a pre-surgical trial, where the patients are given a couple of doses of, of uh, in this case, ipilimumab before they go to surgery. And so these were guys that were given two doses before they went to uh, prostatectomy. And so at the time of surgery, we get the whole organ, you know, minus what the pathologists need for diagnosis. We get the whole organ in for studies, and we can pretty much do anything we want from flow cytometry to multiplex tissue sections, um, RNA expression, genomic sequence, etc. Uh, really powerful technique to get data. And so uh, this is what we found. On the left column here, these are histochemicals. Uh, immune histochemical slides. What you can see here is before treatment, no CD4s, virtually no CD8s, very few regulatory T cells, um, very few memory cells, etc. But after two doses of ipilimumab, uh, it's, it goes from, and I'm not showing the comparative slides, but this looks a lot like pancreatic cancer at baseline, where after treatment, you could see robust infiltration with CD4, CD8s, FOXP3, Treg cells. These cells, uh, uh, just get this activated killer cells here, and macrophages. And so this now becomes to look like melanoma. And so, just to show you uh, what happens, though, so CTLA4 drives the T cells into a cold tumor, but it also induces all these inhibitory. Uh, Markers, as you can see here, uh, with PDO, PDO1, Vista, PD1, and LAG3. So all of those are inhibitory uh, molecules that were induced by ipilimumab treatment. And so you can see the numbers of cells here, or you can see the cells here with PD1, PDL1, and Vista. So these are two very different inhibitory molecules. Uh, and when you look at the numbers, you can see the PD-L1 is induced on the CD8 T cells themselves, as well as on macrophages and the tumor cells. Whereas Vista is induced a little bit on, on CD8 cells, but mostly on macrophages and other studies that I won't show you. We know that PD-L1 and Vista are always expressed by different subsets of macrophages. They aren't ever found on the, on the same cell. And so this then, uh, led to propose something obvious about at this time uh, Beck, uh, Mr. Bauer Squibb had shut down their entire prostate program because you know PD-1 didn't do anything and, and nanocytolate 4 did it occasionally but not enough to be considered significant uh, so we went to them and showed, showed them those data and said we need to give IPI to drive the T cells in and then and a PD-1 or PD-1 ligand to cover up uh, those, that inhibitory pathway that was induced by uh, ipilimumab. And so what you can see here is one of the patients, these are PSA levels, his uh, PSA levels have been rising for some time, uh, hitting almost 500 uh, when he got the first dose of, of anacetyl A4. And a month later, the second dose, and a month later, the third dose. By then, it was essentially at baseline. Uh, and the fourth door is here. Anyway, the patient's um, metastases completely di disappeared, and it was a complete responder, uh, symptomatic relief and everything. So there were a few of these in the trial. So with some uh, fiddling with the, the dose, it was a little bit to toxic in the way that it was done. Uh, it's being reopened with, with a few hundred patients and hoping will lead to registration for the treatment of uh, castrate-resistant prostate cancer. And so, for the rest of the talk, I want to really talk about the differences between these two. There's a tendency to say, you know, we've got two checkpoints, and one of the things that people figured out right away is that, is that PD-1 has fewer adverse events than 
and CTLA-4 blockade, and so let's just use PD-1. But the point I want to make here is that these are very different drugs. It's not just that they're uh, checkpoints and you don't have to think about it. As I told you, CTLA-4 is hardwired. It's part of every immune response that your body makes, whereas PD-1 is in, in induced resistance um, by gamma interferon, um, most of the time inducing pd one uh, It's also been shown to play a role in other settings in the protection of the developing embryo from maternal attack on fetal antigen. So we think that this is a protective mechanism that's just co-opted by cancer cells to protect them from the same mechanism. Um, as I showed you, uh, or the cartoon shows that CTLA-4 works mainly during priming PD-1 on exhausted cells. CTLA-4, I'm not going to show you the data, but it's been shown in several settings to recruit new T cells and expand clonal diversity, whereas PD-1 doesn't seem to do that. It can expand the clones that are already there in number, but it doesn't allow recruitment of, of new clones. Um, so I'll show you CTLA-4 primarily affects CD4 cells. Whereas PD-1 only, actually, only affects CD8 cells. As I showed you, uh, ipilimumab, CTLA-4 could drive T cells into cold tumors. PD-1 doesn't. The response is, again, because it works at priming to anacetyl-A4, often very slow, uh, where there's rapid to uh, uh, PD-1, uh, which you might expect since it's just you're reactivating uh, already differentiated cells. And I mentioned the adverse events. And one of the things that's becoming apparent is that disease recurrence after response with CTLA-4 are very rare. In melanoma, at least, they're usually focal and then can be dealt with by surgery, you know. Uh, whereas disease recurrence after responses with PD-1 are pretty significant. It's about 15% or so in melanoma and 25% in, uh, in uh, lung cancer. Uh, Resistance mechanisms include uh, loss of gamma interferon sensitivity and, and other things. So in order to just sort of get a, a really uh, unbiased way, uh, although it's biased to we're just looking at T cells here, at what plays a role in the response, uh, we use CYTOF, uh, time of flight cytometry, where I'm not going to go through it, I'm sure everybody's heard about it, but it uses antibodies coupled to heavy metal ions that can be distinguished uh, very sharply in a mass spec. And so you can do up to 43 parameters. And so what we did was to use one for live dead, a few for uh, looking at dividing cells, and then a few for barcoding, because we mix everything and analyze it together, and then deconvolute. Um, but, uh, and then you group things by a TISDI plot Called by just putting things which look more like uh, the cells in the grouping here. And then we can identify what those are by different markers. Uh, and then we measure different clusters, uh, the frequency of the cells in different clusters. Uh, and then uh, we keep track, you know, for every mouse that we look at, we keep track of the size of the tumor when it was harvested. And then we can relate any particular changes that we see with the ones that the changes that are important uh, to the size of the of the tumor, and so the the uh, <clears throat> way the experiment's done is that we give mice tumors, give them antibody different intervals, and then day 13 in the case of MC38, we harvest and look at the tissues. Now I'm going to show you just data on MC38, which is a fairly high. Uh, mutation load uh, immunogenic tumor that responds to both these agents by themselves. Um, and, but we also got the same results using a tumor called B16BL6, which is very low in, in uh, mutational load. Uh, it's not affected by monotherapies with these uh, antibodies, so we have to use a vaccine with it. But the results are really the same uh, with both of them. Uh, so this is what the the uh, MC38 tumor looks like when you gate on lymphocytes and then or, or bone marrow derived cells and then T cells uh, or cells express uh, uh, CD3 epsilon. And so here the it's a, they're just dot plots basically representing you know each dot representing a cell. Uh, blue is mice that got control antibodies. Red is mice that got uh, anacetyl-A4. Green is mice that got PD-1. And so what you can see here is that, is that there's a real paucity of uh, 
Well, actually, let me start down here. You look here with NKT cells and gamma delta cells, it's essentially random. There's nothing going on. They're just equally mixed. But what you can see here is there's a real paucity of red dots compared to blue or green uh, in, amongst the Tregs. So this is something that uh, uh, actually was first noticed by uh, Sergio Quesada and Tyler Simpson in my lab, as well as by Alan Corman's lab several years ago, and that in the mouse, the anacetylate 4 antibody can deplete regulatory C cells, T cells because they express so much acetylate 4 um, by mechanism involving macrophages mediating antibody-dependent cytotoxicity. So that's that, and there's controversy as to whether this happens in humans or not. We don't think it is, and I'll show you some data in a, in a little while. Um, but then here are the CD4 effector cells. This is all uh, CD4 cells except the ones that have uh, FOXP3. And you can see here there's an overrepresentation of red dots. So these cells are being expanded by CTLA4. Uh, when you get to the CD8 area, uh, here you can see that overall there seems to be a big increase uh, with PD1. Uh, but there are patches where CTLA4 is expanding cells. And so uh, this is overall um, what's going on. But what you can do, of course, is do a phenograph where you line up each cluster with all the marker genes that they express. So we had all the marker genes from the major cell surface antigens and differentiation um, 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 transcription factors uh, in this panel. And so just to make this uh, approachable uh, and more visible, here we divide it by cell type. Again, no difference in the NKT cells. Tregs, there's two kinds. There's one kind that uh, they all have FOXP3. One has a, a maturation antigen called KLRG1. Uh, those cells and this smaller population that are KLRG1 negative, you can see here, look like they're depleted by CTLA4 treatment. If you look at the CD4 effector cells, there's, there's really two major populations. There's these cells, and I'm going to talk a lot about these cells for the rest of the lecture. Uh, these cells are Th1-like. We call them Th1-like because they have T-bet, and so they make a lot of gamma interferon and, and TNF-alpha. But they also have ICOS, uh, which is, makes them a little bit strange, and I'll come back to what this is a little bit later. But those cells are very strongly associated with decrease in tumor size, uh, whereas this other population, which, which is, looks like an unactivated T cell, uh, don't really do anything. An unactivated CD4, they don't really do anything. Um, with PD-1, what you see is a preferential, prefer, a preferential increase in a subset of CD8 cells that have high PD-1, high TIM-3, and also high LAG-3, so these are what we call exhausted. They're terminally differentiated, but they're also functionally exhausted. They do not divide uh, left to themselves, but they, they're dividing here when you give NPD1, they start dividing. And these are also very strongly associated with smaller tumor size. But what um, is obvious from, from these data is that despite the fact that they've been treated with the NPD1 antibody, they're still expressing PD1. So if the antibody goes away, these cells are going to stop dividing again. We haven't changed the phenotype at all. And this is also supported by some work from John Wary, who's shown um, there's epigenetic changes in the, in the PD-1 gene that lock it on in these cells. You can't do anything about that. Um, and those are not increased significantly by CTLA-4 treatment. Then there's cells here that uh, um, are PD-1 intermediate. Uh, they also uh, are terminally differentiated and that they express the OMIs and similar other markers, uh, but they're, they're not exhausted. And you can see these are expanded by both CTLA-4 and PD-1. Those also are strongly associated with decrease in tumor size. And then there's these cells, um, which look like naive T cells again, and these cells, which are and they're expanded by CTLA-4 as well. And then these cells, which look like recently activated T cells, and, and they're actually associated with bigger tumor size. So these are getting in the way of the responses. So we've really got three populations. Uh, one CD4, which expanded just by CTLA-4. 
one CD8, which is expanded just by PD-1, and then this group, which are expanded by both, that are associated. That are, those are the cells that are playing the, the main role in, in shrinkage of, of uh, tumor cells. And so, just to sort of summarize is that uh, the mechanisms are very, you know, are different, uh, and that may be why, uh, when you put these two things together, everything works works much better. We're working on that now and have some data in review. Um, but measuring these subtypes is a lot more informative than just measuring total CD4s and CD8s. It's telling you who's going to um, respond. And the other thing is that the therapeutic uh, details didn't really matter uh, in this experiment. And so does this happen in humans? Well, this is not obviously as easy to do as it is in mice. We could only find, because the, the standard of care now is, is both antibodies, uh, we could only find one patient that was treated with just anti PD1 and a few that were treated just with um, anti CTLA4, and only a, a small group that were treat, had been treated with um, uh, anti PD1. And so this just shows the same group. And the point is that it's essentially the same. This, the group is expanded largely by PD1. These are these exhausted CD8s. And then this CD4 uh, ICOS positive thing is expanded again by um, uh, CTLA-4, uh, we can see here monotherapy and then also by combination therapy. And you can see here Tregs are not depleted uh, by that CTLA-4. The other thing I want to point out is that the only control that we had here were normal donor uh, PBMC. And I just want to point out that there are none of these cells, the ones that are effective with, with CTLA-4. We can't find those using this panel of antibodies, we cannot find them in the normal blood. And so I'm gonna come back to that in a little while. I think that's, that's very significant. Because it suggests that co-stimulation may have something to do with the regulation of T-cell differentiation. And so I'm gonna show you uh, the evidence, the last, last, next last stuff I'll, I'll talk about. So just for those non-immunologists, there's basically two schools of thought we know that individual transcription factors are associated with the differentiated state of, of, T, of CD4 T cells. Uh, GATA3, for example, is in uh, what are called TH2 cells that make TH2 type cytokines. TBET is a transcription factor that determines that the, TD1, the TH1 fate, which make gamma interferon and TNF alpha, ROR gamma T, uh, sends cells down the TH17 pathway to make IL-17 and other things. And then finally, FOXP3 dictates the uh, function of these cells to be um, Treg cells. Um, so this was thought as a linear process. So, so you've got a naive cell. It gets activated by antigen, and what it becomes depends on what's going on in the environment at that time. Uh, but several years ago, um, John O'Shea and the late Bill Paul suggested that it's more of a, a nuanced process, that there are intermediates between cells. They can go back and forth. There's some that express multiple transcription factors. And so uh, it's been a lot of support for this, but, but not a lot of data so far. And so anyway, what we were thinking, uh, um, this, is, this is work done by Spencer Way, is that one thing that, that, that CTLA-4 does on cells, of course, it it can stop the response, but also attenuates the T cell signaling. That negative effects lower it. So, you know, with a real strong antigen, you might get a maximum signal strength just here at arbitrary units. Um, but if they attenuate it due to high levels of CTLA-4 expression, it's much lower. So, if you take CTLA-4 away, they would give a signal strength that, that's much higher than you could ever achieve you know, in wild-type mice. You get supranatural, if you will. Uh, not supernatural, but supranatural levels of, of T cell. I'm not trying to say these are magic cells or anything, but, but, but you could just get a much stronger T cell receptor signal. And we've known for several years now, due to the work of Kim Bottomley and others, that stronger signals tend to be associated with TH1-type cells. So we decided to look, just take CTLA-4, away genetically and go through this same sort of process and, and see what we've got. Well, the green and blue dots here are wild type and heterozygotes. Uh, and the red areas 
are CTLA-4 knockouts. And what's apparent, by the way, and these are all CD4s with that same, well, not with the same panel, but with markers to different subsets of CD4s. What you can see is there's this group here and then this one here, which are clearly very different than the cells that are you see in wild-type mice. And so what we think is that this is, represents cells, that this represents differentiative space that's prevented by the presence of CTLA-4. T cells in normal mice never get a chance to go down those pathways, where if you remove CTLA-4, they, they can. And so if you go back and you look at the kind of cells that are there, again, absent in wild type and, lymph node, and, 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 and hetero, you see these cells, these are our friends, the ICOS positive, T, uh, TBET positive, CD4s. These are the same cells you get when you treat mice or humans with, with that C clay 4. Uh, this is another population that's um, 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 non, non, uh, non uh, exhausted T cell, intermediate T cell, uh, that has, this one actually has T bet. And then you see this one over here that has BCL6, GATA3, ROR, gamma T. So it has three different transcription factors. That's really a confused cell. Or it's may, well, maybe an intermediate on the way to one of those other, other pathways. And so there's another way to look at these rather than uh, looking at clusters. It's called archetype analysis where the tumor, you start with the T cell you want, with the cell you want, and then measure just going a little bit further away from it and measure what, what cells are there until you get the ones that are the farthest away from a starting point. And so that enables you to, to tell the difference between cells that might have differentiated you know, from there to there directly, as opposed to, you know, you could tell if they follow this pathway. You end up with an archetype here, here, and here that are the furthest difference that they can be from, in this case, normal T cells. So these are the extreme cells um, that are the farthest away. And so when you reanalyze the data by that mathematical type, you see two here that are really here out in these spaces, out in this, you know, CTLA-4 minus space. The two that are most interesting are cluster 5 and cluster 7. Cluster 7, again, is the ICOS positive uh, PD-1 high. These are the, those CD4s uh, that uh, we find when we treat mice with anti-CTLA-4. Uh, these cells are the, the really mixed up guys here. And again, these are the, the uh, it's not shown here, but these are FOXP3 positive. So we think then that, that this is evidence for the fact that CTLA-4 is not just expanding and, uh, cells that were already there. It may be generating an entirely new cell by sending it down a differentiation pathway, which is not possible uh, in the presence of CTLA-4. So this is something that, uh, interesting thing that we're working on. Uh, further to, to get further data. But I want to come back to these now because just the, um, it's not that these were unknown. I'm just showing you all that data because that's unbiased. It's just what the machines tell us. Uh, but um, these cells were actually discovered about 10 years ago by, by Pam Sharma in a pre-surgical study of bladder cancer. Anyway, ICOS is a member of the CD, CD28, CTLA-4 family. This shows a tree. It's got a single ligand called ICOS ligand. Uh, normally, if you tell an immunologist I've got an ICOS positive CD4, I'll tell you it's a follicular T helper cell, which makes type 2 cytokines, or it's a regulatory T cell, neither of which would do you any good in a tumor. And so, as I said, Pam uh, Sharma first found these to be increased uh, in both tumor and blood in patients after ipilimumab treatment. And she, by sorting, she showed that these had all of the CD4 positive gamma interferon and TNF-alpha cells that produced, were produced in response to tumor antigens. Uh, a study with uh, Jed Walchuk showed that that increase was associated with longer survival. Um, and then in mouse studies, showed that they were essential for optimum eff efficacy of CTLA-4 blockade. In other words, if you do the therapies that we had shown under conditions where we would get about a 90% response, it would drop to about 50% if you tried it in mice that lacked either uh, ICOS or its ligand. So it appears to play an important role. Uh, and it seems to be by signaling through PI3 kinase to the AKT pathway. And now I'll show you that this, this is a, really could be considered a 
positive checkpoint. You could target it to improve efficacy of CTLA-4 signaling. So this is a study that we did to explore that, where mice are given a uh, tumor and then given anti-CTLA-4, and along with either irradiated tumor cells or irradiated tumor cells that have been transduced to express ICOS ligand. And these are all the single uh, antibody controls. This is the response rate that you get uh, when you have anti-CTLA-4 plus the irradiated wild-type tumor cells, about 30%, but that goes up to close to 90% if you just put ICOS ligand on the tumor cell. And if you do that at ICOS knockout mice, you don't see, you lose that effect. So this shows indeed that by giving NICTL4 and then ICOS, uh, agonistic ICOS signals, you get a much more powerful CD4 response. And I don't have time to show you the data, but it's because of about a 30-fold increase in cells that make both gamma interferon and TNF-alpha. So uh, we formed a company and made an antibody to this, and it's in trials now. We don't know what's going to happen, but at least the preclinical data is, is pretty good. So I'm going to just finish by saying that you could block multiple checkpoints, and I've shown you negative and positive. Uh, also, there's many things being explored you know, with oclitic viruses and local ablation to uh, enhance innate immunity, uh, blocking other suppressive factors. Vaccines are coming along, and finally, genomically targeted uh, therapies in combination with checkpoints. I think that what we're going to see in the future is that uh, the checkpoint blockade is going to become a part of essentially all therapies and, and it might be combined with radiation or chemotherapies or many, many other things in kinds of tumors that don't respond well to checkpoints by themselves. So just in closing, I'll say this is what we're look, used to looking at in, uh, uh, in, in cancer therapy for the last 30 years or so, and that's you treat a large number of patients and, and compare the median survival to the standard of care or whatever, and if you move it over by a few months, uh, you know, that's the success, and that's certainly uh, important to those patients who respond. But we know now from uh, ipilimumab that you can do that, but also have a response rate of 20% or so in melanoma uh, of patients that, you know, live for a decade after a single round of treatment. Uh, and of course, this is not data, this is aspirational, but uh, what we hope to do is actually move that tail of the curve up as high as we can get it and as many uh, kinds of cancer uh, as we can. And the good news is I think we know the basic rules. Uh, there's still some frustrations in glioblastoma and pancreatic cancer, for example, which haven't responded yet. And we need to get the response rate in the patients who do respond up to, again, as close to 100% as we can. And I'm optimistic they will we'll succeed if we keep going. And with that, I'll finish and close. And thank you very much for your question. Thank you.